Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. My sincere thanks to listeners and those who have liked, subscribed, and commented. Your interest is noticed and deeply appreciated. This is part two of Aikido and Sun Tzu. I'm going through excerpts of the art of war and describing lessons I believe are relevant to the strategy of Aikido. Sun Tzu. Security against defeat implies defensive tactics. Ability to defeat the enemy means taking the offensive. The modern saying that the best defense is a good offense relates to this lesson. Defense alone will not end a conflict. It is remotely possible, but it's very risky and the odds of success are slim. Sooner or later you will have to intercede to end conflict. There is validity to defensive tactics for sure. For example, let's say you find out there has been a rash of burglaries in your neighborhood. Do you start carrying a gun on yourself and start standing guard all night peering out your windows waiting to confront your burglar? How long could you keep that up? Better defensive tactics would be to install an alarm system, put up alarm system signs, install deadbolt locks, perhaps install bars over your windows, or the best option of all, get a big dog. These are all valid defensive tactics. It may not be feasible in this scenario to go on the offensive yourself, but helping find, identify, and catch the burglar would end the problem. It might be that helping the police find the culprit would be the best way to defeat the enemy, to use Sun Tzu's phrase. Remember the old adage, action beats reaction. Offense usually has an advantage over defense. When it comes to solving your problem, not just avoiding it or putting it off, you will be better off being proactive. Sun Tzu. One may know how to conquer without being able to do it. Many modern martial artists are academics of sorts. They can describe how to do techniques or execute strategies without actually being able to execute them to success. Being able to describe something can show that you understand the theory, but putting it into practice is another matter. We must always be careful about being able to back up what we say with what we can do. I think this is a problem which permeates all parts of society, not just martial arts. Everyone wants to be respected for being knowledgeable. In the internet age, one can read up quickly or watch some YouTube videos and sound knowledgeable, yet that doesn't mean that they are doing anything more than repeating what others have written or said. The wealth of information available to each of us in the internet age is a tremendous boon to humanity. You can easily and quickly learn what you want to know. Just make sure that you take that knowledge and put it to use yourself. Knowledge is good, but knowledge with experience behind it is invaluable. Sun Tzu what the ancients call a clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. It's one thing to achieve expensive victories. In military terms, it would mean wasting lives and equipment unnecessarily. If you can win without taking losses and wasting ammunition or supplies, that's the best outcome. From a personal standpoint, having to go to the emergency room after defeating your attacker is a victory, but it's an expensive one. Extraordinary skill improves your chances of ending a fighter attack without being injured, or at least seriously injured. To quote another famous general, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, Sweat saves blood, blood saves lives, and brains save both. I think this is what Sun Tzu is getting at in reference to a clever fighter. Be smart enough to keep your risk low and end the fight with as little effort as possible. If you do this successfully, your strategy was elegant. Sun Tzu. He wins battles by making no mistakes. What I found in a few decades of facing live opponents in competition is that there were two factors at play. First was how well I did in executing and how few mistakes I made. The second was in how many mistakes my opponent made. As my skill improved and I was facing more experienced opponents, a victory often came down to who made the first mistake. That person was usually defeated. This is a strategy I came across in tennis as well. That is, keep your mind on merely making no mistakes. Keep the ball going over the net and let your opponent make the mistake. Sooner or later, one of you will miss a shot and will be defeated. The mind can get caught up in being overly aggressive, and this is where it's easy to make mistakes. If you stay patient and focus on good maneuvering, being smart, and watching for your opportunity to end the conflict, you will have the best chance of avoiding mistakes. Sun Tzu. The clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy, but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. I think the phrase imposes his will could also be takes initiative. We are back to the action beats reaction saying. If you take action which makes your opponent respond, then you are imposing your will. In forcing your opponent to respond, you are manipulating him. This is a good side of the curve to be on. Likewise, being manipulated by your opponent is a bad thing. If it happens, you must act to take initiative back. 
If you do not, it is very likely you will be outmaneuvered and suffer defeat. This point about imposing the will is an elaboration on taking the offensive and not merely being defensive. Many assert that Aikido is a defensive art, and this lesson is strong evidence why any defensive art is not built on sound strategy. Just the concept of Shoto Osezu, which means control the first move, is a fundamental of Aikido. Aikido is not a defensive art, it is a proactive one. I think practicing Aikido as a defensive art is to practice a severely limited version of it, and one which is not reliable for self-defense. Sun Tzu Military tactics are like unto water, for water in its natural course runs from high places and hastens downwards. So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Even modern Aikido embraces this lesson. Do not face your opponent's strength with your own. Flow around their strength and find where they are weak. Virtually all Aikido techniques, even direct Irimi techniques, are designed to exploit Uke's weakness, and even create weakness through Kazushi, or taking of balance and posture. Sun Tzu. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. Although Aikidoka tend to like the flow like water lesson above, the phrase fall like a thunderbolt would probably make many cringe. I see this as being applicable when it comes time to enter and end the conflict. Do so decisively and without hesitation. Make sure you are fully committed to your movement. That is what falling like a thunderbolt represents to me. 100% commitment with no hesitation. Sun Tzu. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. 1. Recklessness, which leads to destruction. 2. Cowardice, which leads to capture. 3. A hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults. 4. A delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame. And 5. Over solicitude for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. These are the five besetting sins of a general, ruinous to the conduct of war. When an army is overthrown and its leader slain, the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults. Let them be a subject of meditation. I'll address each of these in order. 1. Recklessness, which leads to destruction. Recklessness can be acting rashly before you know what's going on. It can also mean letting emotions, not your head, guide your actions. No matter what you call it, be smart with what you do. Use your head. Avoid rushing into things before you evaluate them fully. Decisions made with little information are usually poor. There may come a time when you are in imminent danger and you have to act with just what you know at the time, which may not be much. You just have to do the best you can with what you have. Use your head to solve your problems and you will have a much better chance for success. 2. Cowardice, which leads to capture. Cowardice is being hesitant to act when the time comes. At best, you will miss the opportunity to end your conflict. Avoiding taking action to solve your problem when the time comes can be much worse. You can actually be inviting becoming a victim. Predators avoid targets which may give them trouble, and prefer prey who will not resist. A coward is prey, pure and simple. It's your choice whether you will resist or submit when faced with an opponent. 3. A hasty temper which can be provoked by insults. A quick temper is a gift to an opponent because it makes you easily manipulated. Young men are famous for being easy to provoke into fighting due to their pride and vanity. The lesson here is to be smarter than that. Do not fight unless there is no choice and you have something to gain. The last thing you want is to be baited into fighting over pride. Decisions made in anger are often poor ones. Remember the point earlier about making no mistakes. 4. A delicacy of honor which is sensitive to shame. This is vanity, the idea that your reputation is precious enough that you're willing to fight for it. If someone says that you did something which you are ashamed of, there's no point in fighting over it because they told the truth. You would be fighting only to suppress the truth. Should you win, will the truth not be the truth anymore? Or would your misdeed now disappear? No, it wouldn't. You will only make yourself look worse. Conversely, if someone says something about you which is not true, is getting in a fight over it wise? Would the fight, even if you win, prove that your detractor was lying? No, it wouldn't. There are better ways to deal with both of these. 5. Over-solicitude for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. This trait is mostly focused on how a leader views those under his command, but I think it also relates to how we view other people, even those we care about. We must keep their safety and well-being at heart, but we must not let that concern cripple our ability to be smart in a high-stress situation. Sun Tzu. If the enemy leaves a door open, you must rush in. This lesson relates to the phrase, fall like a thunderbolt. 
and it is probably language modern Aikidoka would be more keen to accept. One thing to point out, that I believe there is a distinction between an enemy leaving a door open by accident and leaving it open on purpose, which indicates a trap. A wise strategist can get a good estimate on whether the open door is an opportunity or an invitation to a trap. Sun Tzu, if it is to your advantage, make a forward move. If not, stay where you are. The great part about this phrase is that it describes being assertive yet patient. This is a careful balance, and strategy is built on these two traits existing side by side. When you see your advantage, never be hesitant or afraid to make use of it. That is when it is wide to progress, and you get the most gain for the least amount of effort. Moving forward when it's not to your advantage is costly and leads to failure. It is experience and wisdom which indicate when it is time to move forward or when to stay put. Sun Tzu In peace, prepare for war. In war, prepare for peace. The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence, under no circumstances can it be neglected. This statement applies on a personal level, too, and you could consider the state to refer to ourselves or probably more accurately, our family. The threat of violence is something you hope you will never encounter, but hope is a poor strategy. With so much at stake, a wise strategist prepares to deal with it. However, preparing for it doesn't mean becoming a warmonger either. Becoming either hyper-aggressive or living in a constant state of paranoia is not healthy. Going out looking for a fight is a bad strategy, but being prepared and confident enough should it arise is vitally important. In the sentence, in peace prepare for war, in war prepare for peace, I see the necessary balance between yin and yang. They must exist in tandem for there to be balance. Sun Tzu ends this lesson with the statement, under no circumstances can it be neglected. How many people fail to prepare to defend themselves adequately? We can see many who never even address it. What happens when they are confronted with violence? It usually isn't pretty and they are often lucky to survive. We each choose our own strategy and counting on luck seems to be a poor strategy. I'm sure Sun Tzu would agree. These are merely highlights of Sun Tzu's book and some thoughts on them. The Art of War is a fantastic read that will stimulate your mind no matter how often you pick it up. There is a great deal to think about in Sun Tzu's writings, and his lessons apply to all aspects of life, not just fighting or physical conflict. What are other topics you're interested in hearing covered in this podcast? Please share your ideas in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube, or go to the Facebook group Aikido the Martial Side and post a comment. You can also support this podcast by donating either through a monthly sponsorship or a single donation of any amount you like. I always enjoy hearing from listeners of the show, whether through comments or questions. Thank you all for sharing your interest. Enjoy your training.